Well, so yeah, I want to thank everyone while the slides come up. Uh, it's been a really exciting meeting, a broad spectrum of talks and really high quality. So um, what I want to tell you about today, I think this was already mentioned in the meeting. I feel like it's a really exciting time where we're now starting to get kind of contact between the theory of error correction and the practice in new ways that uh, are teaching me things. Um, and what I want to tell you about in particular is this story of how uh, this was probably known before, but how I discovered that um, error detection is not just a cheat, but it's a way you can bootstrap your way, perhaps, to uh, really sort of large gain error correction and uh, fault tolerance. And I'm going to show you results from uh, our collaboration at Yale. It's myself and Steve Gervin and Shruti Puri, and also some uh, data from uh, our spin out company, Quantum Circuits. There'll be a little logo that indicates which things come from which place. So uh, we've already talked about uh, NISC machines, and uh, if we focus on uh, superconducting qubits, you know, one of the basic uh, challenges we're facing right now is that you can make, uh, you know, reasonable scale machines, but the error probabilities are still sort of in the 1%, not just uh, for sort of two qubit gates, but also for operations like state preparation and uh, measurement. And these kind of limit you to the amount of uh, entanglement you can generate and uh, the utility of the algorithms that we can have. And so, you know, what uh, uh, I would like to say is that it's not all about engineering uh, and it's not all about science. The answer to this question is yes, it's, it's both. And I'm trying to uh, sort of contribute to both. Um, but uh, what uh, I want to talk about is sort of um, why error correction is hard. So. The basic idea is simple. We just redundantly code information. The problem is uh, now we have more qubits, so there are more fault modes, and uh, errors are going to occur more quickly. And so if originally I had uh, some quantum information that's decaying with a characteristic time scale P1, uh, now I encode in three qubits, and uh, everything decays three times uh, faster. Now, if I have a, only a single kind of error in this distance three code, I will be robust to single errors. So perhaps if I can uh, measure more quickly or uh, correct uh, more quickly than the errors occur, I might actually be able to realize uh, some error correction gain and improve the fidelity of the operations or the lifetime of, uh, of my qubit. And this error correction gain, I think, is the thing I want you to focus on in the rest of the talk. So um, it's harder still because most qubits don't just have bit flips. They have multiple types of errors, and so we're forced to do a larger uh, code, perhaps something uh, like the surface code, a two-dimensional code, and uh, the overhead goes up. Now, the good news is that the threshold can be sort of not completely unreasonable. It's, again, about 1%, so it's similar to where we are today, so we might be close to the break-even point. Um, but uh, there have been lots of uh, nice experiments on doing error correction with conventional superconducting approaches using transmons as the information carriers, um, including uh, the results from earlier this year by Google that uh, Sergio showed, where essentially they're getting just about to the break-even point. And um, what we've been pursuing now for several years is a rather different strategy at Yale. Uh, we want to really focus on the problem that Sergio said was hard and Chris said he wanted to put off for later, uh, so maybe I'm a masochist or foolhardy, but uh, we want to you know, solve the problem of error correction first and then scale in a way which is much more efficient. And uh, so the uh, idea I just have to wait. OK, there we go. So the, uh, the idea is let's find a more hardware efficient approach with lower overhead. For instance, let's use an object like a microwave cavity that really has only one kind of error and it has a longer lifetime. Let's try to make something that's effectively distance three at the hardware level and then be able to concatenate and scale uh, better. Uh, so the basic idea is let's go to an error correcting code like the surface code, but instead of putting in the physical error, let's put in the physical error squared. So is there a way that we can efficiently take 1% to 0.01%? And I want to show you that we're beginning to be able to do that. OK, so uh, what we do this in is uh, the CircuitQED platform. Uh, it's a flipped version compared to what Irfan sort of showed you before. 
we have uh, microwave resonators to read out our transmons, but the transmons serve as ancillas to do measurements and state preparation and control on our real quantum object, which is this microwave cavity, which can have multiple energy levels. We can redundantly encode information. And again, it really just has photon loss. We can't really measure the uh, intrinsic dephasing in these bare microwave cavities. It's very weak. So that gives us a nice error model that we can build. And uh, we've been working on this for a while. Uh, the first experiment to just barely get past break-even, an error correction gain of 1.1, uh, was uh, some uh, seven years ago or so in a more recent experiment uh, uh, from uh, Michelle Devere's group uh, using the GKP code, uh, we got to an error correction gain of about 2.3, which I think is still uh, uh, the only time we've really gotten past break even. So, so now the point I want to make is that um, not all error correction schemes are the same and not all errors are created equal. So instead of having uh, bit flips or phase flips, what if I had uh, errors, but I had some way that uh, inside my machine, there would be a flag that went up. There's an independent measurement I can make that says, ah, an error has occurred, and it's occurred on exactly this qubit at exactly this time. This is an error known as an erasure, and this is actually the very best kind of error you can have. And um, here we're inspired by some recent work in neutral atoms and tweezers by Jeff Thompson's group uh, at Princeton and uh, theory from our collaborator Shruti Puri. Um, so if you have, for example, a surface code where you have erasures, first of all, the threshold moves up by a factor of four or five. That's really a nice thing. But also, um, uh, these errors scale differently. Uh, that is to say, the uh, logical error probability goes not as d over two, but as d. So in a sense, the surface code or other codes perhaps can correct uh, twice as many erasures as the ordinary types of error. So this has inspired us to kind of uh, rethink the way we realize a uh, bosonic qubit in circuit QED uh, by uh, building a dual rail uh, encoding using two standing microwave cavities at different frequencies, let's say five and six uh, gigahertz. And so the logical space is one excitation shared between these two. Uh, and uh, the nice thing here is that then the error process is just that you decay to the vacuum. Now, of course, the dual rail has a very long history. It was proposed many, many years ago and is used in linear optics quite extensively. There have been several recent experiments and uh, proposals about using uh, transmons or superconducting ordinary qubits to uh, make a dual rail. But in our scheme with the dual rail microwave cavities, I think offers a lot of advantages. So uh, first of all, uh, we think about what we know about the physics of this system, and we think about the different types of errors that can occur and their characteristic time scales. We get a kind of amazing hierarchy, which I'm going to show you we can actually confirm in experiment. So uh, first of all, the dominant errors are going to be detectable erasures if we can find uh, when the system goes uh, down to the vacuum. And those occur on time scales of a millisecond. And we can do gates here, single qubit gates uh, and two qubit gates in time scales of 100 nanoseconds to a microsecond. So that's a sort of probability of an error per gate of 10 to the minus 3. The dephasing, given that the lifetimes can be longer than 10 milliseconds, should be at a few parts in 10 to the 4 per microsecond. And uh, bit flips, where you would actually change from one state to the other, requires loss and then heating. And uh, that should be on time scales of minutes. And essentially, leakage out of this code space we could always detect. Uh, this makes for a really attractive sounding uh, kind of a qubit. So uh, how do you do single qubit gates in this system? Well, you want to go from uh, zero logical to one logical by transferring that single excitation uh, between these two uh, uh, distinguishable modes that are at five and six gigahertz. And we can do that uh, using a beam splitter interaction, which is activated by some parametric process using a Josephson junction. And the amplitudes and phases of these RF drives then uh, sort of control where you uh, move on this dual rail block sphere in a way which is sort of technically very much like the way you control transmon. Very easy and very convenient. And we've made, uh, you know, orders of magnitude improvement in our ability to incorporate these parametric mixing processes into this high Q uh, microwave cavity environment and uh, realize these kinds of single photon swaps with uh, a couple of orders of magnitude higher speed and higher fidelity. So. Here we're showing sort of the swaps back and forth of a single excitation 
between Alice and Bob, the swap takes about 100 nanoseconds. And uh, what's really nice is it actually preserves the natural uh, error model of the uh, microwave cavity. It's not introducing any appreciable heating uh, or dephasing. Uh, and um, so we can do randomized benchmarking on uh, this qubit. Uh, we get a fidelity that's sort of a little bit more than three nines. But also what we can do is we can perform a measurement at the end and only keep those shots where we still have at least one photon. So we're going to throw out the detectable one in 1,300 of these gates that we know about. And then the fidelity improves by over a factor of uh, four or so. Um, and so uh, this is really nice. This is you know, rivaling the fidelity with which one can do single qubit operations in, uh, in transmons, for instance, but with a much nicer error model. Uh, so now the basic idea of this dual rail, and again, the task we've set for ourselves is to get effectively distance three at the hardware level. We want to make something which is robust to single errors for all of its operations including, for example, measurement. So you can do quite good measurements on conventional superconducting qubits, but you're in the end uh, limited to about 1% error because the measurement takes a microsecond and the lifetime is about 100 microseconds. But in the dual rail, what we can do is we can map and do this even redundantly because it's a QND measurement, the photon number in our cavities to the transmon ancillae and then read them out. And we have two channels of readout, so we get two bits of classical information. And now, if I'm going to misassign one of the logical states to the other, I actually have to have two measurements that go wrong. Um, so let's see if this works. Um, yep, it does. So what we are able to do now with these extra bits of information is we can say some of these will classify as erasures, because perhaps the measurement went wrong. If we keep only the shots that we know are correct, those are the red uh, bars there, you see that we have uh, uh, logical assignment errors that are a uh, couple of parts in 10 to the minus 4. We can actually do multiple rounds of this and get to parts in 10 to the minus 5. So this is the kind of state preparation and measurement or spam error that's like only uh, usually available in systems like uh, ion traps. So now what we can do is use this very high fidelity measurement to look in a little bit more detail at the physics of our dual rail. So uh, first of all, we can look at uh, Ramsey and ECHO experiments. So we prepare uh, a photon in one of the two cavities. We do a pi over two of the beam splitter, a 50-50 beam splitter. Uh, we wait. And now we have a purple curve, which is the probability that at the end of, this, uh, at, at the, end of the line in this uh, measurement here, uh, we think that the uh, dual rail has decayed. And you see that you can recover coherence uh, out past what is the erasure lifetime or the photon loss lifetime. And uh, it, uh, I find this really amazing here. If we zoom in on uh, these experiments uh, with no adjustments here, this is no scaling of the axes or anything, we can distinguish whether it's 10 times in 100,000 or 20 times in 100,000 that we lose phase coherence in the system. And uh, I'm showing you there a zoom in on 20 microseconds where you extract that the probability of a phase flip in this uh, device during the idling period is like uh, two parts in 10 to the 4 per microsecond, which is kind of a characteristic <laughs> gate speed we're looking at. And it's lifetimes of a millisecond. Probably this is only a bound. I said that uh, logical bit flips would be extremely rare, uh, and indeed they are. Um, we can place an experimental bound at that time scale is like uh, some uh, uh, tenth of a second nearly, or 15 parts per million. But if we look at sort of the actual heating rates, we infer that there's sort of a one part per billion uh, chance of a bit flip happening during idling. Um, so uh, this is kind of confirming this remarkable uh, error hierarchy and uh, making us very excited about this uh, new approach, this kind of qubit. So um, I don't have a lot of time to explain how to do uh, gates and the like, but um, suffice it to say, if you want to do entangling operations, you also need nonlinearity. And what we can do is something which uh, is a controlled kind of cross Kerr interaction between two of these dual rails by manipulating a transmon that's connected to one of the two cavities while simultaneously driving the beam splitter, which makes the two modes indistinguishable so that the uh, transmon can only sort of feel the sum of the total photon number or the joint parity. And you can use this kind of exponentiation gadget 
to uh, basically make an arbitrary uh, parametrizable uh, ZZ gate where uh, the transmon is this ancilla which starts in the ground state and should ideally finish in the ground state. Thank you. Um, so, uh, all right, we had this beautiful device with uh, nice error properties. Now we've invoked uh, the use of a dirty transmon uh, and polluted the system, but uh, uh, here comes error detection to the rescue again. Because if the transmon returns to the ground state, it's most likely that we had no decoherence errors and the gate succeeded. If there was a photon relaxation, uh, sorry, a transmon uh, relaxation event, you'll end up in the excited state if you use the first three levels of this transmon. And if you have dephasing, you end up in the F state. So if you simply can check that ancilla at the end, you get something where you can convert the decoherence errors of the transmon into flagged and detectable erasure. So the way you have to think about this now is a little bit different. There's errors and there's errors. So uh, the first thing is the rate of known failures or erasure. And those are going to be the same as in the conventional platform on the order of a percent. But then there are the unknown errors that you would need a, you know, uh, deal with in a higher order code. Uh, and those uh, would correspond to you know, missed events or two things going wrong and should be at the part in 10 to the four level as we're sort of beginning to uh, be able to show. So uh, if you put that together, what does that mean? Well, to correct the erasures, you need an error correcting code, but it doesn't have to be necessarily the surface code. If we would put such a device in the surface code with these kinds of error rates, uh, then again, it's effectively like taking the physical error probability and squaring it, because if you can beat the erasure threshold by a factor of five or 10, that goes as uh, D rather than D over two. It's like beating the uh, erasure threshold for Pauli errors by a factor of 100. And so this is something which really seems like uh, it would be efficient to scale. Um, if we do simulations of the performance of uh, such a device uh, or such a system, uh, this comes from uh, uh, a student in Shruti Puri's group, and we sort of look at the same lambda that uh, Sergio was mentioning uh, uh, as you would go from distance three to distance five and so on in a surface code made of these erasure qubits, you would expect to get uh, error correction gains of uh, you know, 10 to 100 per layer with today's uh, coherence time. Um, so even without advancing the physical uh, platform, maybe this is, a, a, as I mentioned, a sort of bootstrapping or shortcut way to get to large uh, error correction gain. So uh, I'm a physicist, but maybe I even finished on time. Um, so I want to thank the combined team. Um, I also want to leave with a couple of uh, sort of uh, provocative questions or uh, statements for, for later discussion. Um, I mentioned that I think we're in a very interesting era for innovation and progress on error correction and moving into post-NISC, uh, that if you have this hierarchy of error rates, you don't have to, by the way, go to the surface code. You can correct erasures just with a four qubit code. So there's another way the next layer is also uh, uh, efficient. Um, and I think we should think differently about these things. Really, you want to steer the errors to the code or the code to the errors of the underlying system. And even when you're concatenating, you know, you want to understand what the error model is that escapes from your lower layers of, uh, of the machine and tailor the code to that. And you know, finally, I think. Um, you know, there's going to be a continuum between pure NISC and pure fault tolerance. It's not like we're going to just have noisy machines until they're uh, running at 10 to the minus 18. You can, of course, combine uh, things like the error mitigation that Oliver spoke about, uh, or you know, detection on top of correction or erasure conversion with then uh, correction and then detection of the next errors. I see a sort of way that you can bootstrap your way here. Um, and the final point is, like, don't think about running the machine at super high fidelities. You're always going to want to sort of reduce the overhead as much as possible to get the exponentially uh, largest compute power out of your machine. So we all have to learn to live with errors, but to deal with them in clever ways. And that's what I wanted to say.